after Cao Cao occupied Jiangling did he free up time to deal with the affairs of Qingzhou. In addition to Liu Chong, who was appointed governor of Qingzhou, several representatives of the surrendered faction were all reappointed, and a total of 15 people were given the title of Marquis. Cao Cao's move repeatedly enlisted the hearts of the world's scholars to clear the way for his subsequent campaign in Jiangdong, and it did have an effect. For example, Zhang Zhao, a minister under Sun Quan, was jealous badly, he must often mutters to himself that how Kui Yue's life was so good. There has never been a shortage of high-level strategists in Cao Cao's group, and Cao Cao is often able to take advice with an open mind. However, this situation changed a bit before the southern expedition to Jingzhou. Firstly, Hua Jia's death has not only removed Cao Cao from having a military advisor to ask questions of, but also a friend to whom he has devoted his life, which has had a great impact on Cao Cao's state of mind. Ikanli, after the unification of the North, Cao Cao had hoped that Xun Yu could take up the position of one of the three counselors, but Xun Yu was adamant and declined more than a dozen times in a row. Subsequently, Cao Cao simply abolished all three counselors' positions and became prime minister himself. The differences between Cao Cao, whose personal desires are rapidly expanding, and Xun Yu, who is dedicated to supporting the Han Dynasty, are becoming more apparent by the day. Under these circumstances, Cao Cao had to prepare for a replacement for Xun Yu in advance. Xun Yu was a man of good character, had presided over the government for many years, and was the leader of the Yin Chuan scholarly group. Cao Cao considered that the only person who could replace Xun Yu in terms of character, talent, and origin was Xun Yu, who was also a representative of the Yin Chuan scholarly group. So Cao Cao appointed Xun Yu as the military advisor of the Central, and from then on, Xun Yu, who was so thoughtful and calm, no longer followed the army in battle, but was responsible for guarding the rear. Therefore, when Cao Cao went south to Jin Zhou, some of them were angry, some of them passed away, and some of them stayed behind. The five important strategists by Cao Cao's side, only Cheng Yu and Jia Xi were left. After learning that Liu Bei had fled to Xia Ko to join Sun Quan, many officials around Cao Cao thought that Sun Quan would surely kill Liu Bei and show his submission like Gong Sun Kung of Liao Dong, who offered to send the heads of the Yuan brothers. But Cheng Yu said, you're thinking too simply. Can the situation last year be the same as now? Sun Quan is not Gong Sun Kung, and instead of killing Liu Bei, he will fund Liu Bei's troops, horses, and provisions and unite him against us. Cao Cao was deeply impressed with Cheng Yu's opinion, and he patted Cheng Yu's back and said with emotion, Zhong Da. Thinking back to the defeat of Yan Zhou back then, if I hadn't listened to your plans, how could I have had the success I have today? Cao Cao's advisors are all not easy to deal with, and Cheng Yu is a man of wisdom. Seeing Cao Cao's complacent face, he already has an inkling that the coming battle may not go well. Besides, Cheng Yu was well aware of Cao Cao's ambitions, and as a minister of Han, he didn't want to get too involved and carry a curse for the ages. So he replied, as long as a person knows how to be contented, he will not make a fool of himself because of greed, and now the time has come for me to retire in a hurry. Cheng Yu is politely exhorting Cao Cao not to get carried away, to stop when he sees fit, and openly expressing his desire to return military power and retire. Cheng Yu didn't want to contribute, and the only person around Cao Cao who could discuss military strategy was Jia Xu. But Jia Xu also disagreed with Cao Cao's eagerness to fight against Sun Quan. He thought that Jin Zhou had just surrendered, and that it was too risky to attack Jiangdong at this time, as the people had not yet fully surrendered. So he said to Cao Cao, My wise lord, you have already defeated Yuan, and now you have recovered Jin Zhou, so your military power is already strong enough. If you focus on recruiting talented people, accumulating food, and making the people live and work in peace and contentment, Jiangdong will naturally bow down to you, 
So why do you need to raise a mighty army and rush to a decisive battle? But at this point, Cao Cao is so arrogant that he doesn't have the patience to consolidate his rule and appease his people. So Cao Cao didn't listen to Jia Xu's advice. Perhaps in Cao Cao's view, Sun Quan and Liu Chong weren't that different, they were both just boys relying on their inheritance, and as long as his army pressed in, they could be captured. Whether the news of Liu Chong's surrender from raising his state could scare Sun Quan, Cao Cao is not sure, but it scared Liu Zhang, who was far away in Yi Zhou. Liu Zhang got the news long before Cao Cao's army moved south, and he scrambled to send someone to pay Cao Cao a visit, making it clear that he wanted to submit to the imperial court. Cao Cao was so pleased that he appointed Liu Zhang as general of Zhen Wei and Liu Mao, Liu Zhang's brother, as general of Ping Ko. On Cao Cao's way to the south, Liu Zhang sent Zhang Su, deputy governor of Yi Zhou, to send Cao Cao 300 veteran soldiers and some royal objects. Cao Cao again accepted Liu Zhang's sincerity and made Zhang Su the governor of Guanghan. Zhang Su was promoted, so Liu Zhang promoted Zhang Song, Zhang Su's younger brother, to the position of deputy governor of Yi Zhou. After Cao's army occupied Jiangling, the solicitous Liu Zhang ordered Zhang Song to be his emissary for a third mission to Cao Cao. The reason why Liu Zhang took the trouble to send people frequently to show his goodwill was that he was afraid that he would not be enough to surrender, and he was also afraid that he would get into trouble if he didn't flatter Cao Cao, so he had to test Cao Cao's sincerity over and over again with misgivings. But this time it is really clumsy, because at this time the situation is not what it used to be. The pacification of Jin Zhou is too easy, complacent Cao Cao, now the attitude towards Liu Zhang is. You see, Liu Chong has already surrendered, Sun Quan is also close, these days even the surrender have to queue up, before I am looking forward to you take the initiative to surrender, now it doesn't matter, and if you don't catch up, I'll come back to punish you. No trouble at all, driven by this mentality, Cao Cao has nothing favorable to say to Zhang Song. Moreover, Zhang Song was a short man with an ugly face, so Cao Cao was even more displeased with him, his attitude was very cold. In the end, Cao Cao dismissed Zhang Song with only a post of magistrate. Zhang Song, as Liu Zhang's deputy governor, was considered the second in command of Yi Zhou, but Cao Cao's attitude was not only cold, but also demoted him to a county magistrate, which was a great insult to Zhang Song, thus he hated Cao Cao for it. Cao Cao, who missed his best chance to recover the province of Yi Zhou, did not know it at this time. He confidently wrote a letter to Sun Quan, saying that, Recently I was ordered by the emperor to crusade against the rebels, and that once the flag was pointed, Liu Chong was captured, and that now that I am in command of a mighty army of more than 800,000 men, I would like to meet you, general, to hunt in Wu. Cao Cao reckons that Sun Quan would be lucky if he didn't wet his trousers when he read this letter. In December 208 AD, Cao Cao ordered his troops, along with the newly integrated Jingzhou army, totaling more than 200,000 men, to march by land and water from Jiangling to Xiaokou.